Um, anyway, I hope you like my tie, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah best dress. You got the, this the wrong way around. Right. Um, anyway, look, um, I looked up in the dictionary tonight before I came along um, the word drug. I've never done that before, so I got the English dictionary out. And it said, uh, one, the first definition, a medicinal substance. Two, a narcotic hallucinogen or stimulant, especially one causing addiction. I think that was a rather interesting definition because the implication immediately from the definitions in the dictionary is that uh, medicine good, everything else bad. But of course that's a very black and white way of looking at, uh, at matters which doesn't bear, I think, much scrutiny. And I'm going to suggest tonight that matters are rather more nuanced than perhaps sometimes is presented, not least of all by the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, which in my view needs to be reformed. First of all, let's take the idea that anything which is used for medicine is good. I've had plenty of uh, letters from people, constituents and others when I was drugs minister, uh, pointing out that they had in fact ended up with an addiction to one or more prescribed medicines, sometimes given to them automatically almost, it seems, by their GPs over a long period of time, and that their health was suffering enormously as a consequence. Uh, there, was some, there was one particular case in Polgate, as a matter of fact, of someone who had been prescribed something on a regular repeat basis for so many years, they had gained about eight stone in weight, uh, and no one had actually noticed or suggested this wasn't a very good idea. So prescription drugs can also have their problems, both in terms of the uh, misuse, when they are diverted from the medicinal stream uh, into, Im to, into illegal use, but also, it seems to me, from overuse or misapplied use, within the health service or by, uh, officially, from uh, doctors and medical uh, professionals. And indeed, when I was a drugs minister, I asked the Advisory Committee on Misuse of Drugs to investigate the use of prescription medicines, because it seems to me if we're going to deal with drugs, as we are, with a problem in society, we should deal with all drugs, not simply those that happen to have been outlawed or dealt with otherwise through the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. So that definition in the dictionary seems to me to be a little odd because there are addiction qualities associated with medicinal substances as well. And then there's what the word drug suggests to you when you consider it. Um, if it's in the medicinal context, then perhaps it has a positive meaning for you, like the noun doctor has a positive meaning, or if it's in a, a sense which is uh, about drug dealers, perhaps it's a negative sense, like the verb doctor has, which is a negative sense. Very odd word doctor, in fact that we can have those two thoughts, just kind of all well in double think about the meanings of words. And I always found it rather strange when I see the word drugstore, which is American, of course, uh, applied here as something which uh, is, a, is a warm, friendly pharmacy. Seems to me to be rather, rather odd. So there's an issue about the balance between recreational and medicinal and how that plays out. And there is an overlap there, of course, um, not least of all in terms of opiates. Uh, and uh, when I was suggesting that we should be rather more tolerant towards cannabis for medicinal purposes, which I'll come on to in a moment, um, people said, oh, you can't, you can't legalise cannabis. Well, it's already legalised for medicinal use anyway. Uh, and in fact, we, we authorise the use of far more dangerous substances quite usefully in medicine. Opiates used every day of the week in our NHS to good effect for people who need to use them. So it's a question of what you're using it for and how as to whether or not it's... Um, beneficial or otherwise. So this recreational medicinal break, which people like to present, is somehow not as uh, realistic as perhaps is first suggested. And then there's the uh, break, the black and white issues of legal and uh, illegal. And again, that's not quite clear is it either, because there are substances which are legal in some parts of the world, which are illegal here. I mean, they either should be illegal or they shouldn't be illegal. It seems to me rather odd that it should be based on a branch of geography as to whether a substance is illegal or not. Uh, but it's also the case that it doesn't necessarily bear relation to the damage which that particular substance causes. And uh, I asked, uh, since my um, release from the Home Office, my self-imposed release, when I gave myself time off for good behaviour, um, when I left the Home Office, I then put a parliamentary question down. And my experience of parliamentary questions, by the way, it's always best to know the answer before you put the question down, because um, that way you get the correct figures, and you know which, which formulation to use. And I asked about the number of deaths caused by um, cannabis and by alcohol and by tobacco in our society. 
uh, in England and Wales, actually. And the um, answer from the National Statistician, who wrote to me, was that in 2013, there were 7,080 deaths from uh, alcohol. Um, in terms of uh, tobacco, can I find a figure of tobacco? Can't put a finger on it quickly. It's about 20,000 from memory. The number of deaths from cannabis was, anyone suggest the number of deaths from cannabis? Ten. Uh, we could do one of those kids' things, couldn't we, lower and higher? Um, the, answer, the answer is one. So 7,080 deaths from alcohol, which is legal, of course, more from tobacco, and one death only from cannabis. So people write to me, as drugs minister, when I was drugs minister, and say, why is it that the drug which causes fewest deaths is illegal, and the ones which cause lots of deaths and problems are legal? Uh, is this a sign that the, uh, the system is working so effectively that no one dies of cannabis, and if it were legalised, suddenly there'd be all masses of thousands of deaths. I don't actually think so. I want to talk about alcohol for a moment, because alcohol, as far as I'm concerned, is a drug. And again, at the Home Office, I was insistent that when we talked about drug strategy, we included alcohol and tobacco in that. And it's not just about illegal drugs, it's about drugs. These are drugs. And the fact of the matter is that the uh, abuse of alcohol uh, costs society in this country £21 billion pounds a year. That's the official Home Office figure, so it must be right, obviously. £21 billion <laughs> pounds a year. And that breaks down to about £11 billion as a cost of antisocial behaviour generated by alcohol, which wouldn't otherwise be there. About £4 billion cost of the health service every year. And about £7 billion, that works out, is that right figure? Near enough. Uh, from lost productivity in the workplace. That's an enormous figure. The cost to society of all illegal drugs heroin, cocaine, cannabis, everything else, all these drugs together is 10.7 billion a year. So alcohol costs society twice as much financially as all illegal drugs put together. Now, of course, there's far more alcohol around, and therefore you might argue that the cost per unit or per person or something is different, which is an entirely fair point to make. But it's worth, I think, stressing that alcohol is a major cause of problems in our society. Of course, we can all have a drink in moderation. <laughs> um, and of course, we know the dangers of tobacco um, quite, um, quite clearly, and governments across the world have started clamping down in the last 20, 30 years uh, on tobacco um, quite effectively in Western countries, though there's still plenty of uh, um, British associations, I'm afraid, with uh, rather dubious sales tactics elsewhere in the world for, for tobacco products. When I was first appointed at the Home Office, I went along to um, this drug addiction clinic in, uh, in Chelsea, uh, which was a convenient one from, from where we were uh, geographically. And I went along there expecting to find a lot of people who were addicted to um, heroin in particular, or crack cocaine or other substances which uh, uh, are addictive. And to my surprise, when I was there, I found that half the people there, if not more than half, were actually there due to alcohol addiction. And when I spoke to the uh, professionals who worked in that particular clinic, they told me that in their judgment it was more difficult to get people to give up alcohol than it was to give up other substances such, such as heroin and crack cocaine. So, you know, I have to say my perception of life, as it were, has changed due to my year as drugs minister. And I think we underplay, uh, loosely speaking, we underplay the, uh, the dangers of alcohol and slightly overplay, not always, the dangers of uh, presently illegal drugs. And what annoys me is that the press, in particular the media, have this um, different, different view of how they present the different substances. If um, I argue, uh, this, this has historically been the case, if someone argues that there should be a different approach taken to an illegal substance, then they are being, quote, soft on drugs, or they're being irresponsible, or they're wearing sandals, or whatever else they're that can be thrown at them uh, as an accusation uh, which is meant to be uh, negative in nature. If, however, you suggest there should be some controls on alcohol, uh, then you are a killjoy. Um, that's not a question of being responsible, that's a question of being uh, unhelpful and, uh, and uh, you know, not wanting to be able to enjoy themselves. And actually, alcohol is the stuff that causes the problem by and large. And uh, the evidence from the Home Office, again, is, uh, for example, um, that when we have uh, large consumptions of alcohol, often associated with football matches, and the evidence is from the World Cup, the uh, last two or three World Cups, uh, that actually alcohol consumption goes up and domestic violence goes up. There is a link between alcohol consumption and domestic violence. 
So these things permeate through beyond the streets into the home as well. And uh, I spent uh, my year attempting to deal with some of the alcohol problems in society without, I have to say, uh, as much success as I would have liked. For example, uh, we have a position where, um, at the moment, um, under the 2003 Licensing Act, it is illegal um, to, for, for on the highways agency land, for a motorway service station to sell alcohol, which you may regard as quite sensible, particularly alcohol you consume there and then. Uh, we don't really want drivers presumably drinking pints before they go back on the motorway. But there was a loophole in the law under the, the 2003 Act passed by the last government, I don't think it was intentional, I don't know actually, uh, which says that, uh, well, which, which, which doesn't um, have the same restriction on motorway service stations uh, in private hands. And some of them on the motorway network are in private hands. So there's a test case because um, Weatherspoons on, I think, the M40 from memory, um, put a planning application in to open a pub on the motorway service station there, which they then uh, persuaded the council uh, needed to be granted, uh, and that duly went ahead. I then tried to um, close this loophole um, to make sure that no other private, private um, operated motorway service stations could open pubs. I was supported in that by the Home Secretary, and uh, it was vetoed by Mr Cameron in number 10 Downing Street, who said that uh, it was getting in the way of, uh, of people enjoying themselves. Um, that is the sort of... That's not untypical of the attitudes towards alcohol. So, uh, forgive me for going about alcohol quite a lot, but I think it's important we talk about drugs. We talk about those which are legal in our society as well as those which are illegal. Now, as far as the illegal drugs are concerned, uh, we've got um, this, the large uh, method of control is through the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act, which uh, has been there by definition for 43 years and hasn't really been changed since then. Now, I wasn't around in 1971, at least not around to follow what was going on with that, but it seems to me, looking at the history of it, that was to some extent at least a reaction against the 60s, if you like, the swinging 60s, and those in power who hadn't perhaps been, hadn't been swinging, but had been there resisting it, uh, were perhaps, oh my God, what's this? We need to clamp down on this. And the Act, the 1971 Act, was a consequence which followed. And along with it went the rhetoric, uh, uh, an overblown rhetoric. Drugs are hugely dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we must have this. And, and, uh, and by definition, the more punitive you are, the more successful you are eradicating the drug problem. That's, that was a mindset. And the mindset still carries on to this day in this country and elsewhere, in terms of the official Act of Parliament and in terms of the public statements which are usually made, but not by me, but by other government ministers. Now, having said that, underneath the radar, there's been changes, sensible changes, for example, handing out of cautions as opposed to uh, automatic imprisonment and so on. So there's been changes under the radar, but the minute you want to raise it as an issue uh, in principle, then the old rhetoric from 1971 still manifests itself. And that doesn't make any sense. Now, if you take the, um, the way these drugs were um, uh, classified in 1971, uh, they, were, they were looked at in two ways. First of all, they were classified according to um, how dangerous they were thought to be. So, uh, um, so for example, heroin is classified as, as, as Class A, a Class A drug. Uh, cannabis was classified as Class B. It went down to Class C, and then um, um, in 2007 or 2008, I think it was, uh, Charles Clark brought it down to, to Class C, and then one of his uh, successors at the Home Office under Labour put it back up to Class B, against, by the way, the advice of the Advisory Committee on Misuse of Drugs, which said it shouldn't go back up, but it went back up to Class B. And by the way, we shouldn't, in my view, have politicians assigning these matters. These should be dealt with by people who understand the issue and and go through and give professional advice. In the same way as the Bank of England sets interest rates and politicians don't decide that anymore. I think the advisory committee on issues of drugs should decide classifications and so on while we have the system in place. Um, the second way a, a drug is classified is, is, is scheduled. And the schedule is whether it's got a particular medicinal or beneficial use in society, notwithstanding that it's um, controlled, illegal for recreational purposes. And cannabis is Schedule 1, which means it's got no medicinal use. Which is rather curious to me, because there are medicinal products on the market which have been approved by NICE and by the Department of Health, which are available and can be prescribed, uh, notably Sativex and a nasal spray, 
through the NHS. So how could it be that you have a, you have a substance which is uh, deemed to have no medicinal use officially, and yet actually has got medicinal use, and is there being prescribed by doctors, no doubt, day in, day out? And the answer is, it's a bit like I said a moment ago, that underneath the radar, stuff is happening to reflect reality, but the rhetoric stays the same. And I really got into looking at cannabis from the medicinal point of view, and I did so having been approached by a number of individuals who asked to see me as a minister to go through their particular conditions. And uh, I won't go through that in huge detail, it's not the time, but what I will say is I saw a number of individuals, I insisted by the way that uh, officials met them as well, and I insisted the Department of Health officials met them as well. And they were, in my view, a wide range of disparate individuals who had one thing, two things in common. One is that they maintained that cannabis was helpful to their particular condition, often when no other substance had been useful for their condition. Uh, and secondly, they represented, to my mind, at least a credible uh, collection of people whose testimony I think would stand up, uh, and they did stand up, to questioning from the officials from the Home Office and from the Department of, of Health. And you may have seen it was Leventon Lewis uh, recently, which I spoke at as well, organised for the United Patients Alliance, uh, and many of these people who have got medical conditions have come together to, to join this. And um, they will argue that, um, as I say, they've got conditions which cannabis helps relieve and nothing else often does. Um, I'm not going to go through them de de in great detail, but here's just one at random. Um, allow Jacob, there's an article which appeared in one of the papers, allow Jacob Barrow access to Sativex to aid in the management of chronic pain. And he wrote, for the last five years, I've been a medicinal cannabis user. This has been the only natural drug that has brought me comfort and relief from the long-term pain and complications of my condition. With no adverse side effects, I have found a drug with long-term prospects for pain management and my muscle spasms. Cannabis produces no complications for my internal organs, whereas a cocktail of drugs previously prescribed have worsened the condition and threatened my quality of life more, more and more. Uh, that's not untypical of the uh, statements, the testimony, the evidence I saw uh, when I was uh, in office. And when I called for uh, a more humane approach to medicinal cannabis, I actually received a huge post bag um, on, on that matter. Um, I think 99% of which was supportive of the call I'd made. And many people wrote in really in heartfelt terms saying, um, you know, thank, thank goodness someone's saying this. I was diagnosed, as somebody else called James, I was diagnosed with bi bipolar at the age of 18 and I'm now 23. I've been on so many different kinds of tablets that have not helped and made me worse when I'm on a high. Um, I'm un I'm un I'm un when I'm on a high, I'm uncontrollable, and the only thing that brings me down to earth is cannabis. Shame I have to deal with drug dealers rather than doctors to keep my illness uh, at bay, to help my illness, and I fully support your calls to legalise it, well, that's not quite right, for medicinal purposes. And that, again, is not untypical. It seems to me, it seems to me when I was an officer, it seems to me even more now, if someone's got a particular medical condition and they have identified something which helps them, that it's inhumane to withhold that substance from them. And it's doubly inhumane to criminalise them when they then have to access it themselves, which is what's happening. So I think we need to have a more evidence-based approach, going back to the black and white arrangement at the beginning, the dictionary definition, medicinal use and the recreational use and so on, an evidence-based approach. So I've asked, and I asked an office and I've asked the Department of Health to be more open about um, the use of cannabis for particular conditions because they are reasonably restricted, more restricted in this country than they are in places, say, like Belgium or France. And I hope that will come about. Question, why hasn't it come about yet? I think it's because pharmaceutical companies haven't wanted to run the gauntlet of the 1971 rhetoric. You know, we've got a particular, particular use for cannabis. Um, we have to get that through all sorts of hurdles, it's Schedule 1 in the 1971 Act. Why bother? Let's do something which is a lot less hassle. So they haven't done the research as much as they would like to have done. I think there's probably a second reason, though I can't prove this, is that because cannabis is a naturally occurring substance, um, then where is the financial benefit to the pharmaceutical companies from developing it? It effectively is a herb, if you like, the nearest thing to a herb, in the sense that you just pick it out and it's there. Um, it, how does that help anybody who wants to make money from these products? 
they make money from processing something, and if you don't have to process it, then there's not the money to be made. So I think those two elements together have, have really kept a lid on or held back the research which ought to have taken place. And I think our universities in particular ought to be doing more now to try and bring this forward in the public interest rather than necessarily a commercial interest, um, which uh, has been, I think, the, the, the limitation so far. So that's one category of, 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 um, of change I want to see, which is a more humane, evidence-based approach to work works to help people with medicinal conditions. And people say, well, OK, you're going to let someone use an illegal drug. I say, I remind them that every day we're using opiates and other substances in our hospitals, which actually are potentially far more damaging if they're misused than cannabis is. So that argument to me doesn't seem to stack up. Leaving the medicinal stuff alone to one side for a moment, there's then a question about how you deal with uh, drug use in our country. And there's no question that some drug use is not just damaging for the individual, but damaging for society as a whole. For example, 45% of uh, uh, acquisitive crime, i.e. stealing things, breaking into places and so on, uh, is carried out by people who are addicted to heroin or crack cocaine. That's a huge number of crimes by a very small number of people. So it's quite clear that that has a de detrimental effect both to them and to society <coughs> as a whole. So you know, we, we have to assume that if you have a, a free-for-all, then more of that will occur. So the question is, what do you do to um, identify a better, better regime, a more evidence-based regime, which minimises the harm from drugs, which is what I want to do, uh, without having... Um, to rely on outdated rhetoric, which may be um, inaccurate in what it says. And that's why um, uh, the Home Office uh, commissioned eventually, under some pressure, I might say, from me and my colleagues, um, an international comparative study into drugs. The first such study in 43 years of since the 1971 Act, which was published at the end of uh, October, and which looks at what other countries are doing. It looks at it neutrally. It wasn't carried out by me. It was carried out by civil service in the Home Office to look at different practices elsewhere in the world. Nor was it loaded. We didn't simply look at countries like Holland or Portugal. We looked at countries like Russia as well to see what, what uh, the effects were from there. We tried genuinely to look across the world at punitive regimes and uh, more liberal regimes to see what actually the consequences were of different policies. So it's a very interesting document. It's on the Home Office website, unless it's been removed since I left the Home Office, and you'll uh, be able to find it there. And what that did was, I see we looked at 10 or 12 countries uh, around the world and visited some of those, and it was quite eye-opening. And one of the interesting conclusions from this International Comparators study is that the, the level of punitive um, penalty which applies to drug use and I'm separating, by the way, drug dealing from drug use. I'm talking about drug use at the moment. Um, ha seems to have no effect on uh, the amount of uh, drug use in that country. In other words, you can bang up the penalties or you can reduce them. It doesn't seem to very much affect at all on the level of drug use. That, to me, actually was quite a surprising conclusion, but that's the evidence from uh, elsewhere. So you can pick countries where they've been very, very punitive, uh, like Russia, and you might say, well, drug use has gone down there. It's gone down marginally. By the way, there's a huge HIV problem in Russia because they share needles because of the way that uh, drugs have been clamped down on in Russia. So, or you can look at the UK with its policy and you can say, well, drug use has gone down here, so therefore it must be working, which is what the Home Secretary would argue. Or you can look at Portugal, which has taken a far more liberal regime, and hey, guess what? Drug use has gone down in Portugal. So I think there are societal things, generational changes which are happening, which are actually out with anything which governments are doing, and it's wrong to conclude, therefore, that one particular approach is necessarily having the effect which uh, is causing the downward trend, which is, which is generally what's happening um, across um, Western countries at least. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, there are issues to pursue. What is the best thing for the individual? And I can't help thinking that for uh, law enforcement purposes, it's better to concentrate on <coughs> drug dealers uh, and those who are making money, and some people are making quite a lot of money from drug dealing. Uh, internationally, they're often the same money who are making, the uh, same people who are making money from child pornography or child trafficking, um, or gun running or other undesirable uh, activities. 
I learned at the Home Office, by the way, that the, um, there's a small minority of people in the world who are completely without any morality whatsoever and will do anything to make money, and that's the only thing that drives them. That's a very sad conclusion. There aren't very many of them, I don't think, but there are some who fit into that category. Uh, they're completely without morality, um, and they're the ones who will, who will deal with this week in children or next week in drugs, whatever makes them the most money. They're the ones I want to deal with, as a matter of fact, and I think we should be concentrating our resources on those people uh, rather than someone who's been caught with a, with a spliff in their bedroom, which seems to me to be rather less important in the big scheme of things. So I'd rather free up police time to deal with the, uh, the, the really bad guys rather than those who are using drugs. And I think those who are using drugs um, should be seen as a health issue. Now, they may not see it as a health issue. They may see it as a medicinal issue. They may see it as something which they feel they're controlling. As, you know, I'm having a pint and I'm going to be OK at the end of the pint. Um, or, or it may be a problem if they're having too much of whatever they're having. But if they are, it's a health issue which needs to be dealt with in that way, just as we deal with alcohol in that way. People turn up at A&E departments. We've heard a lot about A&E departments in last week. A&E departments are overwhelmed, partly because of the number of people drinking alcohol uh, turning up there. Uh, that's one of the problems with A&E departments. But we don't then say, or most of us don't say anyway, right, that's a drug, you cause it yourself, off you go, or we'll arrest you for it. Um, no, they deal with it because they've got a health <coughs> issue, and uh, that's the humane way of doing it. So I think the same thing should apply uh, when someone has a, uh, a use of an illegal drug, uh, which then causes a problem as well. Now in Portugal, which I'm very interested in, they've adopted something called dissuasion commissions. And what they've done is they've decriminalised, not legalised, decriminalised all illegal drugs. It doesn't mean therefore that they're legal, just to be quite clear on that point. Uh, you know, parking's still um, uh, not allowed in Lewis, as we all know. Uh, in most of the place, but, um, but it's not criminal, it's just a ticket, which is a decriminalised uh, arrangement. So in Portugal, you still get arrested for having an illegal substance, but instead then of either uh, being given a fine and told to go away, which is frankly probably no impact on your behaviour, or worse in my view, being sent to prison for it. And by the way, there are people in prison in this country. You know our prisons are bursting to, seam, to the seams? The prison population's at its highest ever, and there are people in prison because they've, got, they've, they've had possession of cannabis for personal use. That's still happening. Not very many of them, but there are some in our prisons just for that. So we're still locking up people for possession of Class B and Class C drugs. Um, that seems to me to be nonsensical. And by the way, uh, they come out with a worse drug problem than they go in with because our prisons are riddled with drugs, uh, including Lewis Prison, by the way, which I went up to have a look uh, at quite recently. So that's not a sensible way of dealing with them. Far better to say, OK, we've caught you with a substance. Now, we want to give you a medical-based approach to see that you understand the consequences of your body, you understand the consequences of your family, for your children, for your job and everything else. And the comparison I give, which isn't an exact comparison, but it's like um, uh, if you're caught for speeding, uh, you can be given three points in your licence and a fine, and you might carry on speeding, or you might just look out for the speed camera. Um, or you can go on the speed awareness course. And I know people who've been on speed awareness courses who's, who've been speeding all their lives, who've changed and have stopped speeding because for the first time they realised what the consequences will be for a child if they hit a child. So I think you know, that educational approach seems to me to be effective, and that's what Portugal's done to these dissuasion commissions. And as I say, drug use in Portugal, of all illegal drugs, has gone down. Um, so that seems to me to be worth it. And it frees up police time to deal with the, <coughs> with the dealers. So I'm quite attracted to this health-based approach. I think that the uh, responsibility for drugs should be moved from the Home Office, which is punitive by definition, to the Department of Health, which is health-based. <coughs> that is a case in some other countries in the world, and I recommend that we should do so here, as well as depoliticising the Advisory Committee on Issues of Drugs, which continually takes views which are more liberal than the government of the day because politicians generally don't like taking risks and they believe if they advocate something which is a more liberal approach then they'll get hammered for it. And I thought that might be the case but you know what, when I actually put my head above the parapet in the summer and advocated a sensible policy, from my point of view, on medicinal cannabis, um, I was met with either non-comment from the papers or support and papers like The Sun believe it or not, were, were actually very supportive of what I was trying to do. The Daily Mail was following human stories of, of people who had, uh, had suffered and were using cannabis, and, and suddenly it became uh, a different, a different uh, dynamic. So I hope that politicians of all parties have looked at that experience and, and realised that the press and, and the public, I think, have moved on. 
in a way that some of the rhetoric from politicians hasn't. And the last thing I did in the Home Office was, was lead off for the government on a debate on drugs when I finally got this study out. And by the way, because all sorts of things are said in the papers, uh, just for your knowledge, uh, it was my intention to um, leave the Home Office in about August, uh, but um, I had to wait because um, the powers that be elsewhere in the coalition did not want this document to come out, and I was determined to wait in, in office until I got this document out. And having got it out, I was unable to uh, leave the Home Office. But so uh, the last thing I did was have a debate in the House, which I led off with the government, and uh, I thought it might be quite difficult. There was about 30 MPs present, uh, not a great number. But you know what? Every single MP who spoke from all sides supported reform. <coughs> some, some supported it more than others. Some supported legalisation. Uh, a couple of Tory MPs, Peter Lilly, for example, actually wanted full legalisation. They believe in kind of market forces. Um, and they believe it would take away the illegal trade in drugs if you had full legalisation. Others were in favour of the Portuguese approach. Uh, but everybody was in favour of reform. It was a most interesting debate and uh, I was very pleased that that was the last thing I did in government was to was to handle that debate. So um, there is a mood for change and I think that we should all be prepared, all of us and all the parties, whoever are politicians now, to face up to that and to recognise that the public has moved on, the press have moved on, uh, but the politicians haven't. I'm encouraged by, by um, uh, this to some extent. Here's a headline from The Independent. Tory contender calls for more liberal drug laws. Um, that's David Cameron, by the way, in case you're wondering, before he was party, Tory party leader. So I'm hoping he might rediscover his, uh, his liberal roots um, from 2005 when that article came out. And he supported that, um, a change to the, to the way we deal with drugs uh, when he was a member of the Home Affairs Select Committee uh, in the House of Commons. Let me just say one, uh, one last segment, if you like, before we break, which is um, on the question of... Uh, legalisation. And uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, there are MPs, not very many of them, who believe that legalisation um, is the correct way forward. And I have to say I'm nervous about that um, because I don't know what the consequences would be. And I certainly think it would be difficult if you did it alone in Britain and other countries didn't do it as well. Um, there is, however, um, uh, a series of experiments, effectively that's what they are, taking place across the world with cannabis. And I think it, it is beholden upon um, us in this country to follow those experiments and find out what the consequences are. And that's one of the recommendations um, in the international capacity. By the way, I said in the, in the study, part of the deal with the Conservatives of getting this out was that the recommendations were all stripped out. Um, so they've all got commentary from the officials and observations, but no recommendations. Um, but one of the recommendations was, in fact, that we keep an eye on uh, other countries elsewhere to see what they're doing. What's happening? It's a range of things happening um, and as I say some of them are covered in here as a matter of fact but they're all quite early in, in, their, in their application in terms of legalisation issues. We've seen now the US uh, federal position as being still quite hard line um, on, uh, on drugs generally but we've seen on the other hand Washington and Colorado and other states taking a completely different view. Colorado has a legalised um, Cannabis is now deriving an income from, for the state from that. Um, I happen to think it's doing it in a slightly odd way. Uh, cannabis is now turning up in products uh, which look to me to be attractive to children, which I'm not sure is a very good idea. But nevertheless, they are doing that and they're, uh, and they're spending the money on, uh, I think, on, uh, on tackling drug problems, uh, which, which result from other drugs being, being used. Um, that seems to be a little haphazard. There's lots of American states where uh, medicinal cannabis is now, is now mainstream. And there's an interesting experiment taking place in Uruguay where they've legalised um, cannabis and done so in a kind of state-controlled way. The nearest I can give you, if you know the, if you know the comparison, is the Systems Belaget, the Swedish way of, uh, of selling alcohol, where it's kind of state shops and, and so on. And the position in Uruguay is they use radio waves to identify particular plants. I don't quite understand how this works. Um, and, uh, uh, but it identifies which plants are grown in, in, um, in, in, in the country and which ones aren't. Um, the plants which you're allowed to grow, you're allowed, I think, six plants um, per month or whatever the figure is. Um, and those plants are of a lesser potency. So by legalising them uh, and controlling it in that way, you've actually reduced the potency uh, of, uh, of that particular drug. And they're able, I'm told, 
to differentiate between stuff coming in across the border and stuff which is grown locally. So that's an interesting <coughs> experiment. Um, so I think we need to see how that pans out. There is a mood for change. Um, there's an interesting um, state, uh, speech given by uh, the US Assistant Secretary, um, I think it's named Brownfield, I, I've just asked a parliamentary question about it as a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> where he said, you know, we have to just have a different approach, we have to accept different approaches occurring, and he took actually the line I'm suggesting, that we need to see what's going on and monitoring. monitoring. The US government, the federal government, is now having uh, regular discussions with Uruguay to see what's happening in Uruguay. So, you know, the world is moving on, even if not necessarily everything in this country is moving on as fast as it should do. And there's a key meeting of the UN relevant body, UNGAS, in 2016, uh, when the international conventions will be discussed. And there are certainly many countries in, in Central and South America who want to see a different approach. So it'll be very interesting to see what, uh, what happens there. And my view is that, uh, and this is our recommended to the Home Office, is that we should be monitoring these experiments as well to see what they produce. What do they produce in terms of health implications? Are they good or are they bad? What's the financial implications? What are the crime implications? These things have to be looked at in the round, uh, and we need to be able to say with some evidence base what might then be the correct way for us to go forward. And we should be able to present that, I think, to the UN in 2016 um, when uh, that key meeting uh, takes place. One last point, I think, perhaps, is about, uh, which I haven't mentioned so far, is um, so-called legal highs, new psychoactive substances. And I have to say, these worry me. Uh, these worry me more than um, uh, traditional, so-called traditional drugs do. Uh, whatever you think about um, substances like cocaine, um, the one thing you can say is it's been around for a long time, and therefore there's a body of evidence which says what this does to the body, what the downsides are, how best to deal with someone who... Uh, has got a, uh, an overuse of that particular substance and so on. We've got no such information uh, about, uh, about these new psychoactive substances. What are they? They are substances which have been normally progressed to a certain stage by pharmaceutical companies in the 1960s and 70s. They've then had deleterious effects and they've been discontinued uh, during the experimental phase. But the research papers are now on the internet. And those research papers are now being used to create these substances, which are being created in, in laboratories in Beijing and other places, <coughs> and exported over here. And sometimes the first we know about it is when they appear on the streets, sometimes in the form of a dead body. Um, so they are very serious. And the cannabinoids, for example, the synthetic cannabinoids, are far more, far more powerful um, and far more dangerous, in my view, than cannabis itself, which is another reason to look at cannabis. And we have the odd position in places like New Zealand, which has tried to have a market for these uh, substances, where cannabis is illegal, but cannabinoids are legal, when actually they seem to be, in, in our judgment, and I'm talking about the advisory committee's judgment, uh, more dangerous. So we have to have a way of dealing with those as well, which is a further complication uh, to fit in to uh, the mix. Last thing on, um, on uh, substances you think you might know, and I mentioned we might know what we think heroin and cocaine and other substances do. Um, I was, uh, last uh, fact to uh, leave you with, I was horrified um, doing some work with the advisory committee on, um, on cocaine to find that 80% um, of it now is, cat, is cut with uh, cattle dewormer. So, and I would have thought that um, those who indulge in cocaine might be more worried about the cattle dewormer than about the cocaine. Um, certainly unattractive. It used to come to the country here and be, be cut here with tarpon powder or something. Uh, now it's cut in the country of origin um, and uh, not with cattle dewormer. So let me leave you with that happy thought. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you.